Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. I know it's just going to sound like a plug for the members area after Pat Patterson passed away, but, I mean, if you want to hear about Pat Patterson, I mean, no one's going to top Dave tonight on Observer Radio. So I'm going to say a bunch of stuff here, but I expect, I don't know what to expect on the show here tonight. Like, he may go for three straight hours, and I'll have to figure out how to get it up on the website. But if you've ever listened to Dave talk about his childhood in pro wrestling, I mean, his childhood in pro wrestling was all about growing up and going to the Cow Palace in San Francisco. And Pat Patterson. And obviously, I mean, he could talk for probably about 10 hours just about Pat Patterson in San Francisco. But quite frankly, if you think about the life of Pat Patterson, what did Pat Patterson not do? He did everything. Wrestler all over the world. If you're my age, if you're 45 or younger, I mean, what you probably remember is Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe working as the Stooges, which if you think about all of the things that he did as a character during his career, I mean, quite frankly, it would rank very, very low. But if you actually go back and watch it, the greatest. Him... They were the greatest in that role as Vince McMahon's Stooges. Pat was in his mid-50s at the time. And every now and then, they would actually get in the ring. And they'd get in the ring, and Pat was, like, outworking everybody on the roster. But, of course, at that time, you know, he's old in Vince McMahon's mind. So, hey, he's just going to be Pat Patterson, play a Stooge, be a geek. But, man, that guy could still work at getting in there. I don't know if he could still work at 79, but I would bet that if you put him in the ring for an angle a couple of years ago, he'd still throw better punches than anybody on the roster. He'd probably still bump better than half the people on the roster. A fantastic worker. He went all over the world. And how many times on this show have I talked about peanut-sized brained hadrosaurs writing stupid storylines in pro wrestling? Let me tell you who wasn't in that camp. Pat Patterson. Guy was a genius. If you watched stuff that... The greatest stuff that WWE ever did in terms of, of, I guess, popularity. I mean, they've had their great matches here and there. But watch, like, the, the late 90s, early 2000s stuff. And watch these finishes. They were, like, state-of-the-art at the time. And, you know, now they're still doing these finishes here 20 years later. I mean, Pat Patterson, he designed half of these great finishes that you saw. Maybe even more than that. I mean, he was a, a tremendous mind. He helped everybody. I mean, go up on Twitter today. And look at the Twitter t- timelines of everybody from, like, Roman Reigns and, and The Rock. All of these, these like, everybody. All of this praise for what a great wrestling mind Pat Patterson was. Came up with the idea for the Royal Rumble, which you can say whatever you want about the Royal Rumble nowadays. But if you go back and look at some of these Royal Rumbles that, I mean, nobody really talks about them as great Royal Rumbles. But that 1990 Royal Rumble that was setting up Hulk Hogan and Warrior at the Sky Dome. Dude, we went back and watched that Rumble. That Rumble was awesome. That was an awesome Royal Rumble. Allegedly the first ever Intercontinental Champion. Everybody knows the story about that. There was no tournament, but he was the first Intercontinental Champion. Uh, you go back further than that. You go to today. I mean, Pat Patterson, was uh, he was still working with WWE. He was still working as a consultant. He loved NXT. And quite frankly, if you if you watch so many things like the uh, loaded headbutt gimmick in NXT, I bet you anything that came from Pat Patterson. He did the same gimmick in the early 70s. So you could go through all of these different ideas, these great ideas. I mean, Pat was there for everything. Um, if you want to read Dave's bio on the front page, that's totally free. You can go up there. It's a gigantic bio. It's probably a drop in the bucket what Dave could actually write about Pat Patterson. But big-time wrestling. He worked in the Pacific Northwest, San Francisco, Championship Wrestling from Florida, the AWA, New Japan, WWE. And then, of course, besides just the in-ring, it was everything behind the scenes as well with Pat Patterson. So as far as a guy that did, like, everything that you could do, I mean, he refereed, he was an agent, He was a Hall of Fame wrestler. I mean, he was probably one half of the greatest tag team of the 70s. I mean, as far as a guy who did everything and was like 
I mean, we always used to say it about Shawn Michaels. Like, this guy did everything, and he was great at everything. You could put the guy in the ring as a referee. You could put the guy in the ring as a wrestler. You could have the guy train wrestlers. I mean, you could have him do goofy commentary. I mean, he was great at everything. Pat Patterson, he was great at everything for a lot longer than Shawn Michaels was. So, an all-timer, an absolute all-timer. And Mike, any thoughts on the life of Pat Patterson? Yeah, he was almost great right away. You know, he started wrestling, I think, when he was like 17 or 18. You know, starts wrestling in Montreal in the late 50s, comes to Boston in 1962, hits Tony Santos up, uh, the Boston promoter, when he had went to Montreal. Uh, he knew no English, no English at all. Basically, you know, me, you book me. <laughs> and Santos gave him his cards, and, all right, here you go. And, and he ends up making the connection. He goes to Boston, knows no English whatsoever, goes to a restaurant every day, orders hamburger steak because that's what he knew. He knew hamburger steak. So he would order that every day, and he slowly learned English. And probably the actually the coolest thing that happened to, to him there was he met Louis Dondero, who he was with for decades. His, his very close friend that and still, that's one of the biggest things with his, with Patterson's book. That's the best part about Patterson's book because, you know, there were a lot of, he talks about it. There were gay wrestlers that he met, you know, right away in Boston that took him out and that's where he met Louie. And that's the best part of that book is him talking about his relationship with Louie Dondera. It's been joked about uh, in the wrestling business for a long time. You know, he's been needled about it, poked at it. You heard all the jokes that were made on WWF TV. But that's really the best part about that book is his relationship with him. But he leaves Boston. He goes to Washington and Oregon. And he immediately is a star there. And by the time a couple of years later he goes to San Francisco, he's already a major star. And he goes and works for one of the greatest minds uh, for as, as rough of a personality as Roy Shire was. He was a brilliant booker. He was a great finish guy. You know, he's part of that tree with Eddie Graham and Bill Watts and all those guys. I mean, just incredible. And he's not only working for one of the great minds in the wrestling business, he teams with Ray Stevens, one of the greatest workers of all time to to become one of the greatest tag teams of all time so the education that he got at such a young age and he was such a good worker when he came to san francisco and i know dave is going to talk about that a lot i obviously being a lot younger pick him up more in his wwf days that sergeant slaughter boot camp match which is up on the network from may of 1981 is incredible another thing that pat patterson did that you know people talk about him being the first intercontinental champion he beats ted dibiase for the North American title. DiBiase had already lost it in Mid-South, but they're going to establish this Intercontinental title. The great fictitious tournament in Rio de Janeiro. The shirt that Patterson would proudly wear when he was a stooge. First ever IC champion, Rio de Janeiro on the back. But if you have the Wrestling in the Garden book, I actually had to go to this thing to see if I was remembering correctly that Pat Patterson, there was a formula at Madison Square Garden. You had three matches. That was the Bruno deal. You know, you end up with a, a disqualification in the first one, a double count out in the second one. Then you have the big blow off match. Usually it's going to be some sort of stipulation match. Pat Patterson in 1979 and Bob Backlund went four. And I know it may not sound like a big deal now to anybody listening, but that was a big deal then. All four crowds, I believe, were over 18,000. Uh, the the big blow-off did the biggest number at the end, and that was a big deal. And the work that he did there right up until 1983, where they actually did a deal with Ivan Koloff. 83 is kind of a very interesting year to watch with WWF, but Patterson's only like 39 years old or 40 years old at that time. It's amazing, and obviously he did all the stuff past it. What he did with the Royal Rumble and all that stuff is legendary, and I'm sure we're going to get into it more after the break, but just a RIP uh, and Godspeed Pat Patterson, a true professional wrestling legend. If you're a big fan of these video clips here on YouTube, you're missing out on full-length shows. Down there on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, click that Join button, and when you sign up, you'll have full access to all of the shows that we've got up on YouTube, over 300 at current count. Wrestling Observer Live, The Brian and Vinny Show, and Figure Four Daily with Filthy Tom Lawler and Lance Storm. Hit the Join button, sign up today. You can also click Subscribe, and you'll always be alerted as to when new shows and clips are available.